Welcome to the Meditation Conversation, the podcast to support your spiritual revolution. I'm your host, Kara Goodwin, and today I'm joined by Daniel Scranton. Daniel has been a verbal channel since 2010. The creators, the Hathors, the founders, Archangel Michael, Archangel Gabriel, Ophelia the Fairy, Quan Yin, Yeshua, the Buddha, the Pleiadian Council of Seven, the Zetas, and the 9D Arcturian Council are some of the entities who have contracted to work with him in guiding us through the exciting and turbulent experiences we're having as a collective at this time of the shift. Daniel posts frequent channeling videos on his YouTube at Daniel Scranton, and he has courses on channeling, connecting to your guides, contacting ETs, and much more. So welcome, Daniel. I'm so excited to be with you today. I'm excited to be here. This is fun. Yay! So you've been channeling since 2010, and you channel many different entities. And I wondered if you could kind of describe how you began working with the different entities or collectives, like how you know that something new was coming in, how you figure out who it is. These might be very basic questions for somebody who does the channeling, but from the outside, it's kind of like, how do you know? And what's it like when something new comes in? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, 2010 was a big year um, for me. I woke up around the ten- year 2000. And it's funny that your podcast is called Meditation Conversation, because if I didn't meditate, I don't know where I would be today. <laughs> I mean, living under a bridge, maybe. Um, oh, yeah. I, I, I needed <laughs> so badly that I basically started meditating before I awoke spiritually. So I didn't even know that what I was doing was called meditation. I just knew I needed to close my eyes for 20 minutes. And the best way for me to keep track of the time was to count my breathing. (laughs) So that's how I started (laughs) to meditate. So a lot of funny things like that happened along the way of my path, things I couldn't have possibly planned, things that seem really predestined at this point to get me to where I am today. So I see all of it as like working out for us in these magical, mysterious ways. And the way I started to channel initially was through Reiki, doing Reiki and having things just happen while I was doing Reiki, like my hands moving by themselves like this over the person and me just watching them and going, wow, that's really interesting. And then my head starts going like this And then I start making these whispering sounds like, and that's when I first thought, oh my God, that's like channeling. Maybe I'm going to channel. And so that, that was the beginning of 2010. By the end of 2010, I was channeling. And the really wild thing that happened in between was in March, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I got this huge download of energy and it just kept moving through me and I was talking to it. And if the answer was yes, I would get another surge of energy. And it was the most amazing experience I've ever had in my life. And so that made me want to even go deeper in my meditation and see like what I could feel. And so channeling, the best way to start channeling is to go, how good can I feel? Like to ask yourself that question, like, How much ecstasy and high vibration can I attain through breathing and focusing and sitting still with my eyes closed and being in nature and petting my cat and doing things like that, that like we as a society, I think we're taught to look outside of ourselves for all of that. And once you get this and once you get that, then you'll have it. But it's even when you get that perfect mate car, house, everything. It's temporary. You start taking it for granted, like really quickly. But with the going within experience, that's like, there's always more. There's always a deeper place to go. There's always more ecstasy to be experienced. And that's the way that I basically taught myself how to channel, even though I didn't know that's what I was doing. Because even though I thought it in January and then March happened with the download and then between March and the time I was channeling, the major thing that happened was I asked Abraham, 
I was in the hot seat talking to Abraham saying, what's going on with me? Why am I dry heaving like during your seminar? Because I, all I was trying to do was tap into the energy of Abraham myself. And I'm like having all these weird bodily experiences. And they said, you're on your way. You're going to do what Esther does. But first you have to go through this and you just have to keep going through your resistance and whatever else it was that was blocking it from occurring before you will. And then once I did and they came through the first time, they actually didn't introduce themselves. They just said, we are here for you. And I was lucky. I was never one of those people who was indoctrinated in fear about other beings and entities like that. I never thought about that stuff. Never for a second did it cross my mind that what I was doing was dangerous. And I feel bad for people who have run across those types of fear mongers who are talking about demons and all these crazy things that like, I don't think anyone has to fear at all because the fear only attracts them, number one. So if you're trying to protect yourself against them, you're focusing on them, you're creating the experience, or you have some sort of contract to have an experience that's only going to serve you anyway. So then you shouldn't even fear that. But on top of that, when you're channeling, you're raising your vibration. So if you're vibrating here, normally you're walking around every day and they're down here and somebody breaks up with you and you go, mm, then they have access to you, especially if you go on a bender after that breakup. But when you're up here and you're going up here to channel, which is what you have to do, which is what I train people to do when I teach channeling, then they have less access to you than they ever had. So channeling is actually the safest thing you could possibly do. And so when I, I wasn't worried at all about who they were, but I did want a name for them. And so I asked them, you know, what do I call you? And I was on an Abraham cruise at the time and I'm sitting in my room in the dark and I'm channeling and I'm like, what do I call you? What? And they just said, pick a friggin', pick a friggin', pick a friggin'. <laughs> I swear to God, that's exactly what they said in rapid fire succession. The wise guys. Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> okay. And I just chose the name that my girlfriend at the time had given them. And so that wasn't the right name. Like it was an, it was called, the name was grandpa because she felt like a really grandfatherly energy in them. So I used that for like a year and a mm -hmm. half. And then finally I, through automatic writing exercise, I got the name, the creators and it, resonated and it stuck and it and I got confirmation that it was the right name too in a very bizarre way and so I was like okay I wasn't even looking for that confirmation and there it is and so that's how I started and that's how the creators were born and ever since then there's a separate story for each one <laughs> that has come through okay it would take like maybe half the podcast to go through but if you're interested in any one of the ones I channel and how that started, maybe we could just focus on another one. <clears throat> well, yeah. And I love that story. Thank you for explaining your background. And I guess it's just, is it really clear? You you just get very familiar and comfortable with the energy. And then yeah. when it's something different, it's very obvious. The way that is Esther that... describes it is so perfect because Esther says, mm -hmm. And I heard Abraham say this a million times. It's like having your toe in a light socket. So when you watch me channel and you see my arms go up and my fingers are flapping and I'm forming a mudra and I'm toning and people are probably thinking, oh, and I saw this in a YouTube comment recently, like, oh, your process. And that, it, that is not my process. I did not come up with that. That is all them. So the moment my arms start going up, I'm already channeling. And everything is their oh. process of giving the viewer slash listener what it is that they need to receive the message. Because if you're just going into receiving a channeling without having any sort of preparation for it, it's probably going to go either here or just hit you here, but not here. And that's where it needs to go because the major secret about all channeling and by the way i don't know if you channel but you would be great you really Kara. yes you know why me kara really yeah why 
You have a great voice. I don't know why. Really? You have a great well, voice. Thank yes. you. And, and when I listen to your voice, I'm automatically put at ease and soothed by it. So you would make a great healer, a great channeler. And I, I really don't know you or know what you do. But I think that those and obviously podcasting is a great venue for you as well to put yourself out there because of your voice. But the right now, my voice is more gra gravelly than it normally is because I actually lost my voice a month ago and have been getting it back ever since uh -oh. and still can't hit all the tones that I normally hit when I'm channeling. So there's a transmission of energy that occurs with each channel. I kind of got off track there. But it's a transmission of energy that comes through the channeler. That's the main event. It's the meat and potatoes. And then all the words are just to keep your mind from like wandering off and doing its own thing. Okay. So the mind needs to have some shiny object to stare at while the person is getting the download, the frequencies and everyone who receives a channeling in the way that they best receive it, I don't want to say should, but like the best way for them to receive it, they're getting so much more than words for their minds to chew on. So I'm going to all these Abraham workshops. I'm flying all across the country. I'm going to Chicago and Boston and San Antonio and Phoenix and Albuquerque. And I'm following them all around and cruises, eight Abraham cruises, because I think... I like the intellectual part of it. I like talking about it with my new Abraham friends about like what what's new in this channeling and like applying it. And I come up with my questions and I work on my questions. And I got to talk to them 17 times in the hot seat. That's a lot wow. over like a six year span. And they, but what the main event was, which I didn't realize was the attunements all the energy I was sitting in for hours and hours at those workshops. And I'm thinking I may have spent hundreds of hours in a room with Abraham. And that's what you're getting from channeling that most people don't realize or don't take the time to open up to. And what got me on that track was talking about the movements and the tones and everything, because they're a part of getting a person to open up to what they really need to open up to, which is not the words, which they can always go back and read it or listen to it again for the words, but it's the feeling. People have told me that just by listening to the tones, they went into the channeling state. And then in, in sessions with people too, they'll say they've been starting to receive it before the call or the Skype started with them. Because those people That's... are really in tune and open, and those are the people that are easiest to channel for. Yeah. I mean, as you're saying that, I'm thinking, like, I had a, I'll have multidimensional experiences sometimes, like, spontaneously at night. Not all the time, but sometimes, like, instead of sleeping, I'll just be laying there with my eyes open or closed, and I'll see, like, visions of geometries and things like that. And I noticed it happened earlier this week. And I, when it happens, all my senses heighten. So I can see in like I get visuals, but it's again, very geometric. It's not a lot of like scenes or forms or anything. But my hearing also has, I've noticed that I can change where I'm hearing from. You know, I can hear from like different layers I can uh -huh. change where I'm, you know, and I noticed the second to last time that this happened, I was like, I hear language and I couldn't engage the cognitive part of my brain to understand if I was hearing snippets of English or another language that I don't know that's unfamiliar to me, or if it was like light language or something like that. And I like, I could either try to intellectually understand like, is this English? Am I hearing snippets of English or am I hearing like some other earthly language? Is it a star language? Which I don't know. I know, you know, light language. I don't, I couldn't like know off the top of my head. Like I, I did watch some YouTubes later. I'm like, 
searching like, is it Lyran? Is it Syrian? Is it, you know, and I couldn't remember. I was like, I couldn't Mostly, like you know. get the analytical side and hear it at the same time. And that's the thing. So what's really interesting about it is I channeled in English for six whole months before light language came through me on a massage table while receiving massage. And I never, well, I shouldn't say that. I did think about it for a while before I even knew what it was called. I didn't know it was called light language. I, I tried to figure it out a little bit, like what it meant. But at the same time, and I also thought maybe this is a language spoken somewhere else, but it's not really meant to be understood. The reason I tell you that, that, that story is because if I wanted to understand it, why didn't I just channel it in English? I already channel in English. So what would be the point of giving it to me in another language that then has to be translated, which we all know, the Bible, you know, you lose a lot in translation. <laughs> the Bible right. How many different <laughs> languages? So I, I think that all light language is a way of reaching us that goes in, but still reaches us mm. in the same way toning you don't dissect the tone some people try to and they go they'll message me and say well it's in c minor or c whatever and i'm like i have no idea i don't know i can't retain <laughs> any knowledge about music even though one of the first things that the creators started doing with me early on is in the going in state so back then i wasn't toning yet. And toning came after light language, which is also weird because you would think it would go in the exact opposite order. You can channel yeah, tone. Yeah. And when you say Tony, do you mean, toning, toning, do you mean the, what you do before you start channeling? What you it's in particular do? Channel. The, e -E 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 -E. yeah. the, the channel. Yes. Tone. Yes. Yeah. Right. So. Oh, so they, that they, came after. Yeah. Oh. I was already channeling for like two years before I started toning. And so no initially, they, oh. yeah, they said, sing and ring, sing and ring, sing and ring, ring and sing, ring and sing, sing and ring, sing and ring, ring and sing. And it just was like thousands of times <laughs> I had to say this before I go, oh, maybe I should go take voice lessons somewhere. And then <laughs> the kid, I love to sing. I love to get up at talent shows and in front of my fifth grade music class and stuff and just be like, I'm going to do... I've me I memorized Hurt So Good by John Cougar Mellencamp and I want to sing it in front of the class. And the teacher was like, okay. <laughs> I guess that's better <laughs> than uh, who took the cookie from the cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my early um, career as a singer. And then, so it made perfect sense for me to go take voice lessons from a woman whose studio is called Singing for Your Soul and who now has all kinds <laughs> of, of course. experiences. Yeah. <laughs> And she and I are still close. So she sat me down one day and said, well, let's tone to warm you up. And that's the ringing part, by the way. So singing and ringing, I realize now, oh, sing and ring, ring like a, like a tone. And so once I started toning, I was also learning about the power of sound through Wendy Kennedy's channeling. She's a brilliant channeler. And she's channeled a lot about tone, the power of tone and sound. And I was listening to her recordings like on repeat. I was so interested in them. And then I said to my coach, Kimberly, I want to learn how to do this overtoning stuff and throat singing. And she's like, well, I can't teach you how to do that because I don't know how to do it. So then all of a sudden the creators came through and started making these. I'll do the creators, just the tones. So I don't, I hope that you're, thing here, whatever this thing is you're using, doesn't edit out overtones like Zoom does. <laughs> but I guess we'll find uh, out. I don't think it does. Okay. We'll find out. I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah. This is how they sound. This is approximately also what they sounded like the first time. Yes. 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 Oh, 
So that's how they started coming in with three of those. And I didn't even know it was three until a friend of mine pointed it out to me. Because <laughs> basically the way that oh, I, really? yeah, the way I always channeled was, because first it was sing and ring, then it was light language, then it was tones. So I always would just be like, okay, I'm going to channel now. And then boom, it just is automatic. There's no, I never had lesson, never learned from anybody how to do it. But the way it started, it looked like this. And that was it for 45 minutes to an hour. And just no, no me, sounds coming out. No sounds, just me contorting. And that's why I was also asking Abraham, like, what is going on and why is this happening? And then I didn't know what to do. I thought it meant I was trying too hard. They said it's because you have resistance you're working through. So I took, so I, I was glad because I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to do it the wrong way and go about it the wrong way. But, you know, when you've been meditating for over 10 years, you have a, a knowing of like how to tune in. Like, I think meditators are probably better manifestors too, because it's all about focus. Meditation is all about focus. And so if you can focus yourself and be like, you know what I love is, I, I love thinking about this. So in the movie, The Aviator, which is a very underrated Leonardo DiCaprio, Martin Scorsese film, he is Howard Hughes and Howard Hughes had mental illness. And he's like sitting in his house, like growing his fingernails, collecting his urine, like in the dark, not doing anything. And he had to go face Congress. And Alan Alda plays this guy who's like accusing him of all these things because he was his like richest man in the country and they were upset with something he was doing and he got his act together to face his accusers and showed up at court looking well groomed and lucid and just was like and i think about that moment in that film a lot because it's like when you have a need to pull it together and focus and he had to focus to defend himself. But it there's something really beautiful and magical about that. And I think that like if you like it, it's similar to the stories you hear of like, well, the woman's child was trapped under something heavy and she lifted the heavy object and the kid could get out. And uh, when there's a need, when there's a focal point. So, for example, healing on somebody else much easier to do than healing on the self. And the, the reason that is you're showing up for that person. That person is in pain. You have compassion for that person. You want to be the healer that they've been looking for. And so you pull your act together too and align and go, okay, I'm going to let this energy through me now for my friend. And that's kind of how my whole channeling started because I was doing Reiki on people who two people in a row had bad backs. And I think it was because I knew how to meditate. I just knew how to focus. Even though I had one Reiki one, they didn't really teach me anything in Reiki one. They're just like, you're supposed to place your hands here, 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 and here for five minutes. And that was the totality of what I learned. But because I was like self-taught meditator and all, I was like, I know how to focus. I know how to like open up to this energy and let it come through me. And that's basically how I've always just channeled is just by going like, okay, it's time to focus and open up and let this energy in. Well, so to if we go back to what you were talking about, where like the words are really just sort of something for the person who's tuning in to, for their mind yeah. to kind of grasp. So for yeah. your particular channeling, because you use the mudras and there's like a visual <laughs> along with <laughs> the what you're carrying energetically because of course we're so layered like our beings are so layered with through the five senses but then the sixth sense also and, and our bodies are getting signals and so forth so uh, is it is it important so like when I listen to you sometimes I just put on a YouTube but I'll be going for a walk and I'm not watching I'm just listening so I'm curious like do you think the whole thing is important including being able to see 
the mudra and the, the motion and so forth? I'll say it's the best experience you could have. Like you could watch Top Gun Maverick on in the movie theater or on your phone. Like it's up to you mm. how you want to experience something. But obviously Tom Cruise <laughs> wants to make a movie that would be a movie for the movie theater post COVID. So I, and I've never seen that movie. I just know everybody loved it, but it, it's like that. Like you'll still like people only read the channeling. They're on my email list. They probably don't even know that I do it on YouTube because they don't scroll down long enough to see like, there's always a green circle underneath it where you can click that and watch me channel it. But uh, yeah, the mudra and things like this, I think, yeah, it's like reminding me, be in your heart. This is all supposed to come through your heart, not your head. And the mudra, I think, captures the energy and brings it back around in a circular thing where it's not coming out, it's going back in. And then the other hand is doing this. So I think the flickering, the, the fingers are touching each other when they do this. I think that's releasing energy. So it's a very strange, and I could be wrong about both of those things, but but I'm pretty sure that this, and by the way, when I just channeled those tones, I haven't done this in ages. <laughs> I don't know, this was- like Really? Podcast, <laughs> yeah. Because when I used to go my singing <laughs> I take the singing lessons and I would, I would go like this when I would sing. I would sing with my eyes closed. And it was like I was playing the accordion. The whole time, my hands oh. are like a jellyfish kind of. Jellyfish. I was gonna say jellyfish. I was getting a very like sea creature. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, and aren't jellyfish just the most meditative? Like you could just stare at them at the aquarium for hours. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, totally. Um, yeah. But if you see one swimming next to you in the ocean, not so meditative. <laughs> no, <laughs> you don't want to keep, Depending keep on it. how poisonous they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, so how do you feel? Do you want to do a little bit of channeling? Mm -hmm. We got a little bit with the collective, but. Oh, that. Yeah, the toning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's see who, who wants to come through me right now. with all of you 
Yes, yes, yes. We are so happy to be here and to spread some galactic energy around to those of you who are receptive to it. You all have some Arcturian inside of you and you have roots in our system. And that is why we are one of the main groups that is coming through channelers like Daniel here at this time. It is to remind you of where you come from and where you are headed because we are in the ninth dimension, which means we have ascended already into the non-physical from having lived in physical bodies for many lifetimes. And that's what you are in the process of doing right now. So we have been where you are going and we can lend you a helping hand in reaching that level of consciousness that you are moving closer and closer to every single day. It truly is in the living of your life that you get everything that you need to take you to the next level of consciousness, but you can always use help from above. And that's what we offer. That's what Pleiadians offer, Syrians, Andromedans, so many groups from this very galaxy are looking towards humanity and planet Earth to be of service. And we are happy to count ourselves amongst those groups. And now we are prepared to take your questions. Oh, wow. Well, thank you so much. What an honor to be with you. Yes. So one question would be many people who are waking up feel an urgent need to wake up their loved ones, such as spouses or children. And generally speaking, what do you say about the responsibility that humans feel for the awakening process of their loved ones? You are responsible for putting into word and action everything that you have come to know as true. You're not supposed to be convincing them by telling them to believe what you believe and trying to prove it to them. But as you be true to yourself and you become a living, walking example of those truths and how to put them into practice, then you are of greatest service to your loved ones. But it's not through slipping them little hints and giving them books. It's through always being in the highest vibration you can be while in their presence, taking care of your own stuff, your own issues by applying the principles and the practices that you learn. And you also are creating that experience with them. You're co-creating that experience because you have something to grow from by having people in your life who don't agree with you who think you're a little crazy. So it actually is helping you as well for them to not just go along with everything that you have discovered to be true for yourself. And that's an experience that you need to have in order to grow and evolve. But you can trust and have faith that they have their team and they have their guides and they're going to get everything that they need to awaken and be at the level of consciousness you are, just like you did. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. Yes. So when we talk about the shift and the ascension process that humanity is undergoing, there are a couple of overarching theories about new earth or the ascension of humanity, one being incremental and the other would be all at once in a flash. What's your perspective? The incremental one works best for all of you because it gives you the opportunity to experience your own growth and have it be something that occurs because of what you have done within yourself and what you have chosen rather than 
a benevolent being like your son suddenly flashing you into alignment and up leveling your consciousness so that you can live in the fifth dimension. And you also have that other timeline that people talk about where there's all kinds of destruction and natural disasters and this collapse and that thing having to happen first, like full disclosure and so on. And you don't need any of that. You don't need anything to happen outside of you. And you are deciding, just like a person can decide, well, the only way for me to grow spiritually is through suffering. And if I suffer enough, I will grow spiritually. They can hold that belief within themselves and they can live that self-fulfilling prophecy. But another person can say, well, my spirituality is about my ability to focus and be in a high vibrational state and offer myself up as a teacher and be of service and to work on letting go of things that don't serve me. That's my spirituality, but I don't feel like I need to go into the depths of despair and hit rock bottom before I have a spiritually transformative experience. So you see how there's always going to be choices and there's not just one timeline and there's not just two timelines either. And so you're choosing from a wide array of possible experiences for the completion of the ascension. Mm, I love is. that. Thank you. Is. So there is a common religious teaching here in Christianity that Jesus died for the sins of humanity and any person who believes in Jesus will be saved. What do you think about this? Well, we think that people need a good story sometimes to keep them going. In other words, if you only have yourself to rely upon for your salvation and you don't really believe in yourself, then you need to create a religion or an understanding of your afterlife and what's going to happen to your eternal soul to give you some sense of stability. So a lot of people start out in a faith like that and then awaken to the fact that they are the same as Yeshua was. They are the son of God, the daughter of God, the being that is God, and that they contain everything inside of themselves, and that Yeshua was a wonderful teacher, and that was not part of his teaching, but was a part of the church's teaching, and that a council of people came together well after he was gone to decide what the faith was going to be about and what the Bible was going to contain in it and not contain in it. And so you can look at it from a very cynical standpoint and say, well, they just wanted to control people. And uh, it was either a king or a pope or someone who wanted to keep everyone under control. And that is a way that many people do look at it. And certainly there are agendas always that are not for the best of everyone. But if you look at it from the standpoint of a soul and a soul coming in and wanting to have different experiences, you want to have every different way of knowing God before you can choose the way that works best for you. So you have atheism and you have agnostics and you have Christians and you have Hindus and you have Muslims and Jews and all kinds of different faiths and different people that run the gamut in terms of what those beliefs are, all with different ways and levels of consciousness for knowing God and knowing what the relationship is to God. And then eventually you get to the point where you say, well, I'm really the one to determine what I believe in, what I don't believe in, what my relationship to God really is and where my points of salvation are within myself. And so it's a story that worked for a lot of people for a long time and still works for many people to help them feel safe about their eternal soul. But obviously, it's not the highest level of consciousness that you can approach that topic from. Mm. Okay, thank you. 
It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. From your perspective, can you read the light quotient on the planet? 54%. Wow. Okay. And have you seen it rising or accelerating? Ever since 2012, yes. Okay. And, and what? And continuing. Okay. And is there, does it hit when it hits a certain, is there a tipping point? such that when the light quotient gets to a certain level, then that kind of hits 5D or? First, you're going to have full contact with ETs in physical form. You're going to have a mass landing of ships first before you ascend because they're going to offer you teachings. They're going to offer you more energetic downloads more of that attunement that you get from being around a highly evolved spiritual being. And so they're going to also, of course, change the way a lot of people look at themselves and look at the galaxy and the universe. And that's going to help to raise the entire consciousness of the human collective to the point where you will have that tipping point moment and you will shift in waves of people. When the first wave goes, they'll be helping the second wave and the first and second waves help the third wave. Mm, wow. It is. Okay, it's a universal you. ascension. Everyone is going to have an experience of it. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Well, for those who feel a growing galactic connection in their own lives, where they have a sense that their consciousness comes from or is connected to star systems, what advice do you have for discovering more about where they are from? Well, you're from a variety of places and ultimately you're from all places because you're from source. So if you just determine for yourself what star system you're into at the current moment, then you'll know that you're meant to be getting something from your connection to that particular star system. But it doesn't mean it's the one place that you originate from and that you descended to earth in this lifetime from that place. It just means that you have a long and storied history throughout the galaxy that includes many lifetimes on many worlds and many star systems. And whichever one you feel most aligned with in the moment, there's a reason why you do. Mm, okay. And it might be because okay. you're just meant to be exploring that particular relationship, not because you're getting the signal from your home planet. Okay. Okay. And as for you as ninth dimensional Arcturians, you yeah. said that you're non-physical. So are you physically anywhere? I mean, even if you don't have a physical body, you only are light. But we still align where... our energy with the red giant known as Arcturus. So we still have that as what feels like our source for now, but we are able to be everywhere and nowhere simultaneously. Okay. So you're and you wouldn't be like on a ship out just outside of Earth's atmosphere. No, but there are Arcturians like that. that are. There are fourth dimensional Arcturians okay. and fifth dimensional Arcturians and sixth dimensional Arcturians. Okay. okay. Yeah. And if I can just ask one one more question of you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about timelines. We touched on them a little bit, but, um, you know, there are a lot of different predictions out there about what's happening and talk about timelines and timelines collapsing and so forth in the intersection of personal and collective timelines. Is there anything that you can provide some clarity or perspective on in terms of, of timelines here on Earth? Well, it's really like the books, Choose Your Adventure where once you choose to go down a certain route where one thing happens, then other things will happen logically in sequence to that first movement in a certain direction. It's also true, and people need to keep this in mind, that 
those timelines aren't empty. They're filled with a version of Earth, a version of humanity, and a version of you, each timeline. So there's not just one you and one Earth, and you're all choosing what your future is from the present moment, but all of those future possibilities exist with another version of the collective that will reflect to you the work you've done on yourself and will be the best reflection that you could possibly have to you of what you're vibrating. And that's how they work. So there's always a, a collective, a version of the collective that you're a part of and the galactic and universal collectives on each and every timeline. They're all just possibilities that exist for you to choose from. And so it's kind of like we're tracking into the timeline of our choice yes. in a sense. Yes, indeed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, beautiful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been beautiful. I can feel it in my heart. My good. heart feels so warm. Thank you. Very good. Yes. We are the Arcturian Council and we have enjoyed connecting with you hi there hello that's amazing thank you <laughs> so when you're in that state are you still were you there the whole time I was there how's it work for you i you know i enjoy it i enjoy being a conscious channel and being able to observe it because it's nice to speak in that way like I feel like I'm so much more together in that in that channel <laughs> state, but now I communicate and I'm communicating for them I'm doing my best to translate the energy that they're giving me into words and I just like I feel like it's just a nice experience for me to have it and to feel that plugged in feeling too of running their energy through me but you know, it, it is interesting that it's like different depending like if I'm on camera or if it's for a podcast or YouTube or if it's a private session, it's always a different experience depending on a lot of different factors. But I really love doing it. My ego kind of struggles a little bit because my ego enjoys so much also to be a part of things and express itself. And then my ego has to like take the back seat and let them <laughs> do it. But then my ego was also getting a nice sort of stroking when I was thinking about while it was happening, like, oh, it's so like eloquent. Like, it's just so much, there's so much better at this than I am. Explaining <laughs> <laughs> things, you know. Oh, well, you're very gifted as well in, in it, even when it's Daniel. But, <laughs> yeah, well, after a while, you start to merge with them a lot, which is another yeah, phenomenon yeah. in channeling. It's like you become what you channel over time. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. and so you teach channeling. You help people learn how to do this. And I'm curious, like, do they do a lot of people adopt the methods that you do in terms of like the toning and the mudras and so forth. Is that all part of the people that you help too? Well, what I notice is there's a lot of similarities in most people will channel some sort of movement first and like they'll get some sort of tingles or warmth. And um, a lot of people do channel light language and they do one thing I've noticed a lot in my channeling classes, which is different from my experiences lately, people are saying there's with their eyes closed, they're seeing faces, they're seeing colors or seeing geometric shapes, like you were saying. So that mm -hmm. is a big thing that's happening right now for some reason I'm, I'm discovering. That's interesting. And do you see what's it like behind your closed eyes when you're channeling? If I need to see something, I will. I'll see in okay. my mind's eye, they'll give me something that I need to see. But most of the time, there's no visual happening. Okay. Well, so tell us about some of these, the ways that you help people, some of the offerings that you have. I know you have your book as well. How can people learn from you? 
I have, well, I have a new book that unfortunately I can't hold up right now, but though the older ones are back there, there's a series of five volumes of Ascension, the shift to the fifth dimension, because that's how long I've been channeling the Arcturian Council for a while, seven days a week, and now it's down to five. And so I self-publish and I put them on Amazon and I just, you know, put them out there. They're available in Kindle and paperback as well as hardcover now. And they're called, I don't know if I said this, Ascension, the shift to the fifth dimension. And then I, on my website, danielscranton.com, if people sign up to be on my email list, you'll get a lot of emails, but, you know, ha- uh, probably over half of those emails are with like new channeled information or recycled channeled information that is from a couple of years ago, but it's timeless. It's like, it's a timeless mm-hmm. message that will apply to any day, any time. But you also get a free guided meditation from Archangel Michael and then 50% off code to use on my site. But I'm always having new classes, courses, events that I put on there in the events tab. And I do a Thursday night session every Thursday where I channel some group like the Arcturians and they answer all the questions. People can ask one or two questions at that event. So those are a few of the things. And then on my YouTube channel also, yeah, if you go there and you watch me do it, you tend to get all of it. You get the tones and the movements and then me talking at the end. (laughs) Yeah. And you do private sessions as well. Private one-on-one. Yeah, I do. As you know, there's a bit of a wait for that. (laughs) Yes, I just got on your waiting list and I'm so we're recording this in the middle of August and my first time that is available with you is February 1st. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Actually 5 and a half months is not that bad for it's been as No. Long as, at times it's been up to 6, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Well, it's something to look forward to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll have all kinds of questions by then. (laughs) That's right. Yes. Well, this has just been amazing. What a huge blessing to be with you and be with the Arcturians today. I can't thank you enough, Daniel. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Yeah, and the cat was here too. (laughs) I know. I saw. So gorgeous. (laughs) 